uh, in today's lecture. Uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, in today's lecture, we will study uh, about preventing MEV in sequences. So in last lecture, we had a brief intro about what MEV is and what are its types and what are the good and bad tools for the ethereum ecosystem. Today's lecture will go into more depth of it or how does MEV really affect the ecosystem, be it positive or the negative side and what are the steps taken by the community to basically build upon this and kind of trying to tackle it or maybe trying to just live with it. So let's begin. Uh, so what is MEV? Uh, here is a summary from the last lecture. Uh, maximum profit which a block producer can get uh, basically by uh, manipulating the mempool. So you change the order of transactions or you change the arrangement of transactions in a block. Uh, uh, so it's basically the maximum value you can extract from a block production in addition to, you know, the standard reward you get and the gas fees you get. Uh, this is the additional money a block producers try making uh, from basically the mempool. Miners or validators, uh, they generally include transactions on the mempool uh, in the block which pay the highest fees. Uh, um, that makes sense economically, right? Uh, so there is a term in MEV called searchers. What are these searchers? They basically scan the mempool continuously through complex algorithms. So the mempool is public, right? So they, uh, they spot MEV opportunities in the mempool. And what you do is they quickly place their transactions with a higher gas fees uh, to get their transaction related fit first. Uh, it does involve risk because you're paying a lot of gas fees and sometimes it ends up being in a lot of competition among different uh, uh, miners uh, or validators who are trying to compete for that same MEV, but uh, the risk is worth it. Uh, examples of MEV includes front runs, arbitrages, uh, sandwich and liquid agents. These are four general types of MEV transactions. Uh, an interesting fact is that 99% of MEV transactions are arbitrage and sandwich transactions. So there is a term in uh, MEV which is called guest call sync. So what is that is you try to program transactions in a way that it uses the least amount of gas. So you basically optimize your contracts or if you're not using uh, a part, if you're not doing a contract based transaction, you will just try to program it in a way that it uses the least amount of gas. So what it uh, does is it allows the searchers to set a higher gas price while keeping their total gas fees constant. So so the equation is gas fees is equals to gas price multiplied by gas use, right? So you can set a higher gas price if you uh, basically uh, use a lower amount of gases. It's inversely proportional, right? Uh, example techniques include uh, using addresses with a long string of zeros. What it does is it consumes le less space, right, uh, in the stack. And so it occupies less gas and takes less amount of storage space to store. Another example can be you leave small uh, token balances in your contract. Uh, so instead of just uh, emptying them or draining them completely, you leave a small amount of balance in your contracts. What it does is it costs more gas. Uh, why you do is because uh, it costs more gas to initialize the storage slot. Storage slot happens when the balance is zero in your contract. Uh, so it costs more gas in that case than uh, it costs to update a storage slot. What are print runners? Uh, so basically they are generalized bots. Uh, what I told, uh, uh, basically the most common form of MV. You uh, you just watch the mempool continuously and detect profitable opportunities. So these are the type of MV transactions. So this is a flowchart showing a sandwich transaction. So what a sandwich attacker does is, uh, uh, the attacker was continuously uh, monitoring the mempool and just got to know this uh, uh, target transaction. So assume it's a wheel. And this transition involves a large amount of ETH being purchased, for example. Uh, so this will definitely cause uh, a dip or uh, an, a surge in price, right? So what uh, the attacker will do is he will place a transaction uh, which will involve a higher amount than the target transaction before the target transaction. So you friend, that's called front running a transaction. You place your transaction before that. And how do you ensure that your transaction will be uh, uh, basically uh, arranged first in the block is by paying a higher gas fees to the validator. So they validate your transaction first. And what you do is just after the target transaction, you back run your transaction. So what happened is uh, when you front run, you bought a large amount of a token at a very low price. And after the target transaction has taken place and your front running transaction has taken place, the price has definitely surged, right? So this is the, this is what happens after, uh, after sandwich this. And uh, just after the price has surged, you just dump it, dump it. So this is the amount that uh, that is uh, the profit of an attacker. And it's a zero sum game. 
for the amount that user loses is the amount that attacker profits. So basically, uh, 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 ignorant people are just victimized. Uh, so this is the most dangerous form of MUV transaction, and uh, it seriously uh, dampens the ecosystem's opportunity to you know to scale and expand. Another type of transaction is liquidation. Uh, what, uh, so this is an example of Aave, which is a lending and borrowing protocol, and you have a concept called health factor. So whenever your health factor drops, your collect collateral can be liquidated, right? So what do they do is, uh, attackers in this case, they observe such uh, accounts uh, which are on the verge of liquidation. And uh, as uh, they're not unable to basically pay their fees back, so what do they do is, they settle the transactions on behalf of them. Uh, and they take the collateral plus the liquidation fee and they repay the loan on their behalf. So this collateral plus liquidation fee minus repay loan is that amount which uh, uh, the attacker will benefit in this case. This is a positive side of MEV uh, because uh, they are uh, in this case helping a protocol like Aave maintain uh, itself because uh, health of any land, uh, lending protocol depends on how well uh, people who have borrowed from there are able to repay its debt. And send this transaction was a transaction uh, was a type of MEV where uh, it seriously uh, impacts the ecosystem negatively. This is the third type and the most classical type of MEV transaction, which is an arbitrage transaction. So what an MEV bot does is it uh, uh, places a swap event on Uniswap for 0.065 e, for example, swaps it with another token on Sushi Swap, and then just uh, swaps it back to 0.069 e. So basically, it's trying to uh, you for the same asset. Uh, if two different uh, you know, protocols are offering different price, so you uh, harness that opportunity uh, of difference in prices at two different dexes and you just uh, make a profit, which was 0 0.04 here. And if you like uh, what MEV bot does is, it, is they'll scale this transition to a massive amount, let's say 65 ETH or 650 ETH and then, and like uh, for now, the profit might sound very less, but if you multiply it by 1000, the scale in which actual transactions happen in case of MEV, then this will be like a, a free money for basically nothing done, just being a little more smart. So what are the solutions you ask? Uh, so the topic is PBS flash bots and MEV boost. Uh, yeah, it might sound overwhelming at the moment, but uh, let's try to uh, get into them one by one. So what is PBS? It was the most uh, famous architecturally proposed method to tackle MEV. So what happens in pre uh, what happened at that time was present day uh, So this the present day in this uh, slide uh, means uh, day when this uh, this method was not developed. So Ethereum validators create and broadcast blocks. That's what general happens in Ethereum, right? You have a validator who will create a block and then will propose it, and then uh, other validators will uh, basically vote for it. Uh, what you call as attestations and after it has achieved a majority which is two-third of the votes uh, the uh, block will be justified and after another block is justified on top of it the block will be finalized so this was a standard method for uh, validating a transaction on ethereum chain what this method proposed was proposer builder separation so the task of proposing a block and the task of building a block was separated in this so it splits these tasks across multiple validators now block builders are the ones who become responsible for creating blocks and offering them to the block proposer in each slot. So they, you have a new role introduced, which is a block builder. Uh, and what does that block builder do is basically uh, uh, that block builder will now create every block and it will offer them to the block proposer and the block proposer cannot see the contents of the block. What do they do is they simply choose the most profitable one uh, and they pay a portion of the fees to the block builder before sending the block to its peers for validation. So what it does is like, how does it make sense uh, is that uh, initially like solo validators who don't have very complex algorithms to run can be left out of the system in this case where MEV, uh, because MEV can lead to centralization. Very easily uh, can MEV lead to centralization because advanced uh, systems can not be used by everybody. And so what this does is let the task of extracting MEV be on block builders who have a very large, uh, sophisticated hardware for that purpose and uh, let individual validators like you and me be block proposers. And so block proposers will definitely get the share of MEV and what this does is it will uh, more equitably uh, distribute the rewards or more equitably uh, share the rewards among all the validators. So the builder will basically extract the MEV opportunity and then will bid 
will uh, make a bid and send it to the validator with a promise that uh, if you include my block, uh, and so we'll share, split the profits, right? And every validator who will attest to that block will also be having a share of the profit. So now everyone can get a much more fairer share of uh, MAP uh, in this case, rather than compared to MAP centralization. What is Flashbots? So Flashbots is a research and development organization uh, which works on uh, uh, minimizing the negative effects of MEB and avoiding the risk MEB could cause to blockchains like Ethereum. Uh, their products include MEB Boost, Suave, uh, MEB Inspect, MEB Get, MEB RS, MEB Explore, and many, many more. So yeah, MEB Boost, which was mentioned here, is one of their uh, products only. So what is MEB Boost? It is an open source middleware uh, which is run by validators to access a competitive block building market. So just now before I told in PBS uh, that now block builders are the one who are building the block. So they use a sophisticated software called MEB Boost, uh, which is a middleware. And so basically it is run by validators to access that market. So you can't, so proposers can't really access uh, builders uh, without MEB Boost because you have no guarantee that uh, the builder who has bid, who has made a bid will definitely pay uh, the proposer, uh, the fees they promised to pay until there is a, there is a commitment made, right? Uh, so what Flashbots does, what MEB Boost does is, uh, it uh, kind of legalizes that commitment. And so now uh, the builder is uh, obligated to pay. So uh, that builder doesn't end up losing reputation and just gets thrown out of the network or sledged out of the network. So MEB Boost is an implementation of PBS for POS Ethereum, right? So PBS was used separate it uh, and currently uh, Ethereum doesn't have that feature. Uh, so validators are the only one who propose the block. Each validator is chosen randomly to propose a block, uh, taking the number of validators, which is the current number of validators in Ethereum network. You get to, if you are active uh, on the Ethereum uh, as a validator, then you will get to propose a block, uh, let's say every two months approximately, considering the number of validators Ethereum currently has, which is a very large number. Uh, so. Uh, right now the builder uh, methodology is not implemented directly, but it is in process and MVB boost is one such implementation. So you have something called as a builder API, which we will look later in the lecture. And so builder API is that communication spec, which allows this builder and proposer uh, to communicate. So MVB boost legalizes that commitment, which builder was bidding for and MVB boost ensures that the share is being distributed. So now validators can access blocks from a marketplace of builders. Builders produce blocks containing the transaction order flow and a fee for the block proposing validator. Separating this role promotes greater competition, decentralization, and censorship resistance, as I explained earlier. So now is it okay to centralize block building? That's the question that might pop up in your head. Because right now in PBS, what we are trying to say is, doesn't matter who proposes blocks, right? We said that large institutional investors can because they have a sophisticated hardware. So is it, isn't it? it like centralizing block building? Well, the important concept is prover verifier asymmetry. And it refers to the idea that centralized block production is fine as long as there is a robust and a large number of validator network who are able to prove that the blocks which are built by the builders are honest. So as Vitalik says, decentralization is a means, not an end goal. What we want are honest blocks, right? So basically it's completely fine if uh, the person who is building the block is a centralized entity, doesn't matter. But we do have a very large number of nodes, uh, what you call as validators, who are able to prove that the block which was built by that entity is fine. So you don't have any more censorship resistance or centralization in the main network. So uh, this is how MEV Boost actually works. So let me explain it. Uh, so this, this is your user and this is that uh, role I was talking about searchers. What these searchers do is, is they will track for those profitable opportunities and these are run by builders, right? And they might, they might be independent. They might not be. So these track for profitable MAB opportunities, share it to the builders. So builders will pass them through something called as relays. Relays will pass them through MAB boost. And now this was your Ethereum client, right? Uh, which is, which, uh, which has an execution layer and a consensus layer, both in Jenga running and local block building is taking place. But, uh, as I mentioned, the client can't directly communicate to the builder. So what it does, it does through the builder API. So this is a, an experimental implementation of, uh, PBS proposal builder separation in current Ethereum. 
you can't directly communicate, but you can surely communicate through this. And it has several functions, which will look later uh, on how does consciousness client really communicate. So uh, this is a basic flow of how a block building takes place. The builder will build the block, propose it to the relays, pass through the MEV boost. The MEV boost will extract the most profitable block, will pass through the builder API, and then the consensus will vote that I'll uh, propose this uh, XYZ block. So let's take this very simple example, and this will make clear every single thing I just spoke currently. So we have a search array. He has a bundle of transactions. He are, uh, from the mempool, he identified these three transactions, uh, uh, 0x0, 0x1, 0x2, and uh, they in net profit 0.25 ETH to the validator. We have another searcher who has just one transaction in his bundle, but that single transaction can profit one ETH to the validator. We have yet another searcher who has two transactions in his bundle, and those two transitions collectively can profit two ETH to the validator. And we have yet more searcher who has two more transactions and they can collectively profit three ETH. So these searchers, according to their capabilities, have identified some potential transactions from the mempool for so which will they will uh, broadcast to the builders. And uh, the transactions accordingly uh, varies in their profitability, which was 0 0.25, 1, 2, and 3. Just be careful of the numbers because those numbers will add up of what this really means. So Searcher A, Searcher B, and Searcher C broadcast their transactions to Builder A. So Builder A gets this block 0x00, and what he has is Bundle 2, Bundle 1, and Bundle 0, arranged in their order of profitability, which was 2 ETH, 1 ETH, and 0 0.25 ETH, respectively. And if you sum them up, this will in net profit 3.25 ETH, right? And Searcher B, Searcher C, and Searcher D, what they does is they also broadcast their transaction to Builder B. So Builder B has this block, which is 0x01, and arranged in their profit transactions are arranged in their profitability order, which is bundle three, which is three, bundle two, two ETH and bundle one, which is one ETH. And in total, it sums up to net six ETH. So now you can very starkingly see the difference of what builder A is proposing a block and builder B is proposing a block. And this block has almost half the profit of the block that builder B is proposing. And so uh, from here itself, if you don't even see the rest of the architecture, let's say you hide it. Uh, if there was no builder, there would have been a centralization at this point because the validator would never ever get the share of what this profit means, right? And so what now builder does is builder A uh, sends his block to relay A and relay B. What uh, the same relay I talked about here, right? These are the relays which are used to communicate with MEB post. And so relay A, what does is relay A tells block 0x00 is the most profitable to propose. Relay B tells block 0x01 is the most profitable to pr propose. Okay. So this is your MEV boost. Now your proposer, as we mentioned earlier, doesn't know your builder doesn't uh, validator doesn't know that what are the contents present inside the block. So a blinded block 0x00 and a blinded block 0x01 will pass on to the MEV boost. This is your first step. Okay. Uh, so both blocks, which are blinded because the validator can't see what are the contents inside the block. He will just have to assume what MV boost tells that will be fine. So the MV boost now compares the profit, which was block 0x00 and block 0x01. 0x01 will profit 6 ETH to the validator and block 0x00 will profit only 3.25 ETH. So MV boost tells that block 0x01 is the most profitable block to propose to your client, which was your validator. So the consensus client now, after uh, getting this instruction from MVV boost will say, I will propose 0x01 since that makes me more profit, right? So now MVV boost will request the relay B to uh, say that validator will propose 0x01, fine. So relay will send the full block 0x01 to MVV boost and then MVV boost will send the execution payload for this block. Consensus client will then propose that block, validate that block and after getting any, uh, Two third of attestation, the block will be finalized. Block 0x01 is on your Ethereum network. So this was your whole architecture which goes behind before a block is now finalized on the chain uh, in case of MVV boost. So these are searchers who spotted opportunities, they sent it to builders, builder then bundled them according to their profitabilities, sent them to relays. Relays said that this is profitable according to me and this is profitable according to me. The blinded blocks are then sent to MEV boost. MEV boost compares what is sent by the relay and then tells the consensus client that this XYZ block is the most profitable to propose. Consensus client has to believe what MEV boost says and uh, will just propose that block because what uh, consensus client gets is blocks and the profitability they offer. That is it. They don't get to see what are the transactions present. So no censorship at all. 
and MEV boost now will ask the relay that validator will propose this block. So please send me the full block. The full block will be received and the execution payload will be sent to the consensus client and then your normal execution consensus client communication will start and your block will be finalized on your Ethereum niche. So this is how MEV boost works in its architecture and I hope it was very clear. And if you go function by function on how this relay uh, and maybe boost and consistent communication really happens. So I showed six steps, which were uh, layman's language of what this, this works, how does this works? And if you go into the, the more depth uh, of trying to understand the specs of how does this works, then this is how it works. So consensus client starts up, you use the function. The consensus client starts up, you use the function register validator on the MEV boost, the validator gets registered, MEV boost then registers that same validator onto the relays. Now, consensus client will wait for their allocated slot. So this slot, we are talking about the general slot committee, right? Which works in Ethereum based on RAND DAO function. And after get, uh, the consensus client has uh, achieved their slot, they will use the get header function to request the header of the block they, they are going to propose. The MEV boost will then broadcast that function to the relays. Relays will send a, a response, which will be get header response. MEV boost will verify that the response matches as it was expected. And it will also select the best payload, right? As it said that MEV boost will tell that this was the most profitable block for you. And the consensus client will just get that response, will sign the header and will then ask for payload from the MEV boost. MEV boost will then identify the payload source among all those relays that have sent, request that particular relay to uh, give the payload. The relay will validate the signature that is coming from that particular consensus client. It will give the payload response and MEV boost will again verify if the response matches expected and the consensus client will then get the payload response and will then just go on to the validation and the two third attestations and the block will be finalized. So these are those four functions that are used in this process. These four functions are the core part of Builder API and also your MVV Boost uh, GitHub repository if you go into that and try to study of how this code really works. Uh, so this was uh, the uh, uh, overview explanation of how you will try to understand and this was the function by function explanation of how MVV Boost works. And this is uh, your PBS uh, and this is the solution we currently have to tackle MEVs. So basically you are uh, trying to prevent censorship as well as you are trying to distribute the shares, which was identified by the searcher equally among all the validators thus promoting more decentralization. So that's it. Let's move on to the last part, which are the risks and the considerations you have to take while uh, using MEV post, right? So number one is li uh, liveness and local fallback. So the Ethereum network uh, has to be alive at every single time, right? You can't lose any particular state. And uh, if, a, if the network is halted for, let's say, a few seconds or minutes also, then it can be troubling. So to prevent that risk, MV Boost is implemented as a sidecar for consensus client software. Like if you see this MV Boost is just integrated with the CL client and it's not on the Ethereum main chain at all. So you run MEV boost along with a full uh, consensus node as well as an execution node on your system. So it doesn't uh, affect any other validator if you are running an MEV boost. Uh, next is builder centralization. So a builder that dominates the market because of its uh, you know outsized profitability, it gains the ability to, for censorship. Now you should note that MV boost is not something that is uh, that is uh, creating censorship, right? It is MEV that is creating censorship, not MEV boost. MV boost is instead trying to basically encourage the competition among a lot of builders to basically build the most profitable block and then just broadcast it onto the network. So MV boost is trying to tackle this builder centralization, but it is definitely in its very early stages. Then there is another risk, which is builder or relay collusion. So anyone can be a relay, right? This was the most trickiest part in this, that Relay is centralized. Yes, Relay is centralized in uh, MEV Boost implementation. And now you might just ask that, that that is a problem as well because Relay can, according to its wish, block a particular transaction or can unblock a transaction as well. Now, while this is a, you know, a strict improvement compared to the MEV extraction model, which was in proof of work Ethereum, but Relays can still be a risk. And they can be a risk to both builders and validators because the builder is also is also trusting relay that the relay will forward their block, and the MEV boost is also trusting that relay is, you know, sending that most profitable block. 
and uh, another is then uh, very obviously comes malicious release. So nothing prevents malicious release from submitting fraud bids, right? Uh, and that will obviously affect the profit. And your last is MEV hiding. Uh, this uh, is something that node operators, uh, when managing, uh, when trying to make off-chain deals with uh, customers, uh, they are incentivized to hide MEV rewards in a given block. And then this also basically, uh, you know, makes the network suffer and everyone in the consensus committee suffer because uh, they are trying to basically uh, demeritize uh, the whole system of decentralization. So this was it uh, about MEV. I hope uh, it was uh, uh, it was clear and uh, thank you.